Hi there, I have a really amazing game to show you today. It's from that amazing Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit. So Elizabeth Harmon was playing against Vasily Borgov. Let's have a look at this game, and it's loosely based on actually a real chess game that was played. Uh, so Vasily Ivanchuk against uh, Patrick Wolf. So in, in the game in the series, the move order to get to a key position was actually via the Albin counter gambit. This move offers a gambit. And usually it's taken in the series, e4 is played, and we get a position which is uh, really quite interesting. This move order is a bit on the dodgy side. It's not usually played in real chess games because black could play e takes d4 here. And for example, this is easy equality for black, being able to exchange off the queens once the bishop moves. And in fact, white would lose casting rights there. And also, if queen takes d4, then again, it's kind of an easy position for black to play with a a tempo gain there so but anyway it's fictional but it is based on a real game because we get what's called by transposition to the real game that it's modeling so here we get a, a position from the Ivanchuk game so Ivanchuk was playing white and they had this position Ivanchuk against Patrick Wolf so these are two players that have both beaten Kasparov at one time uh, or another so Patrick Wolf beat actually Kasparov in uh, a series which was called the American Gambit, which I've actually covered on the channel. So Kasparov obviously has a deep respect for both Ivanchuk and Wolf to feature both of them, but in effect. And the whole series does show this element of huge respect for the players and the history and culture of chess and the prestigiousness, the sheer prestige of the venues. It's absolutely gorgeous. So even if you're a complete non-chess player, I really urge you to see this whole series, and maybe more than once. It's um, getting great reviews and is is in topping many countries' charts for the most watched Netflix series going. So anyway, this is by transposition to that a real game now, and in fact, it's following <laughs> a tango. <laughs> I don't know if Kasparov's seen my tango games. I like the tango to g6. If you want a course on this kind of tangoing, I have actually a course uh, King's Crush TV slash Opening Tango. If you want to learn about tango. What you'll notice about this d5 pawn chain is that the corresponding dark squares are potentially weak. At the moment, though, this bishop is stopping a strategic bishop exchange. If black could exchange off these bishops, these dark squares like f4 would be even weaker. And quite often, when I'm playing uh, in real games, I often try and exchange off this bishop and weaken these dark squares. But here, yeah, white's in control and, and actually plays f3. And so there is a consideration if white's weakening these dark squares further, a positional plan is sometimes, you know, that's sometimes on to just exchange off. But we see bishop d6 here, queen d2, bishop d7, knight g e2, a6. We see bishop b3, b5, a4. And so black castles now, both sides castle now, white castles, queen e7, rook a c1, and now knight h5. This looks like a nice square, quite aggressive. If black can get a nice knight into f4, sometimes it's dangerous, for example, like this, threatening chatmates with the knight assisting the queen on, on a killer common square, what I call a killer common square on g2. So this was preempted with g3 against any knight f4. h6, bishop c2, rook a b8. And we see a takes, a takes, rook a1. So white gets that file. Black challenges, bishop d3, targeting b5 now. So we see bishop b4 pinning the knight against the queen, preventing any capture on b5. White takes on a8, releasing some of the tension in the position. Unpinning now with queen c2. We see bishop c5. So finally, this strategic bishop exchange, which I mentioned before, it, because white's already kind of weak, pawns don't go backwards. These pawns committed on light squares, the adjacent dark squares. It makes sense for black to try such a strategic bishop exchange. We see now knight d1. The bishop actually goes back here. So maybe black was put off with the dynamic potential of taking, you know, this knight hopping in, potentially, you know, later to f5. That could be dangerous for black strategically. So we see here bishop d6, knight f2. And now knight f4, a really, really interesting move, a temporary peace sack. White ignored this with rook c1, just trying to target c7, keeping the bishop tied down to c7. So this pawn, a slight you know, backward pawn weakness, what's called a backward pawn weakness. And we hear that in the series when Elizabeth is very keen on different pawn structures. You, you see her 
reading books about pawn structures and it's actually something maybe because of the series it's at the back of my mind I should really investigate pawn structures myself so I've been looking into isolated pawns and backwards pawns recently so anyway there's a backward pawn on c7 to try and torture to keep the bishop tied up one problem with these weaknesses is not just the act of trying to win them you can also just tie up the opponent's pieces and attack on another side of the board so you often get an extra element of mobility in fact you can just torture your opponents with them so here though if white had taken on f4 it seems there is actually dynamic potential here for for black after knight h4 this is quite dangerous for white's king so ideas of queen g5 and if knight g4 you know taking on g4 it's very dangerous if black ever gets a combine and win on g2 that's that's going to be chatmate and for example this this is kind of dangerous it's, it's at least equal anyway okay so uh, we see uh, also by the way if uh, let's have a just look at this again if bishop takes f4 had been played bishop takes we see this position is going to be actually better for black this this kind of thing is better for black that's going to have a significant advantage there sometimes being able to take on g4 and use this excellent outpost square on e5 so white is generally kind of weak on these dark squares and if black can get a highly entrenched outpost like a knight on e5 that would be beautiful but this is a very calm as a cube cool as a cucumber move just avoiding all the complications of taking here not giving up uh, key strategic square like e5 this would be very bad in this pawn chain to have an entrenched knight on e5 because a knight outpost on e5 by virtue you know of, of being on e5 it will be difficult to front the attack so that kind of thing just calmly avoided with this great positional move rook c1 we see queen g5 king h1 so here this unpins the pawn that pawn was pinned there so now white is threatening potentially to take but now queen h5 and again it's far too dangerous to take this knight actually because of the impact of queen takes f3 and maybe a knight swinging here and there's too much attack potential and also at least winning the bishop on e3 this is also a loose piece in the position so white just defends f3 it looks as though white's on the defensive but after knight takes d3 this is a piece which wasn't really fitting in with the light squares anyway it was a light square bishop kind of hemmed in by its own pawns knight takes d3 and we see quite an aggressive knight now which can pop in to c5 potentially and in fact this is a weakening move now f5 and knight c5 is played to, to try and tap into the e6 weakness bishop c8 the bishop was attacked by the knight we see rook f1 knight e7 and now queen d3 a strengthening move and also hitting b5 so we see f takes f takes queen g6 so if white ever dared to take on b5 then e4 is a bit weak and maybe bishop takes c5 and then queen takes e4 so we see uh, king g2 here king h7 knight f3 and now knight g8 is played so this is a, a kind of typical maneuver to put more pressure on e4 knight rerouting sometimes going backwards to go forwards to put more pressure on e4 so is white crumbling here because there's ideas like here and and then taking on e4 with the queen and knight combining against e4 so this is a bit sensitive this square right now we see knight h4 tempo gain on the queen queen g4 knight f5 we see knight f6 and now h3 and here Vasily Borgov uh, basically said you know adjourn and the adjournment in chess is a really uh, special thing so basically he, he doesn't play his move on the board he puts his move in a sealed envelope they bring him a sealed envelope and you seal your move that's adjournment uh, unfortunately I had too many adjournments that I care to, to mention in one of my leagues the Hertfordshire Chess League so adjournments you know sometimes it's weeks later months later I had one which was months later and the, the day before you know, the night before I'd done all this analysis it was torture my opponent just offered the draw and I just accepted it so it, it became a, an exercise in analysis so anyway overnight Elizabeth's friends had been analyzing uh, the position so anyone can do that so it, it, it does it, it is part of chess culture these are germans but not so much nowadays in normal over the board chess only in certain club leagues in novel in normal rated over the board chess uh, germans generally don't exist anymore especially with the advent of computers it's like computers can really take over and play like super gm so you your rating isn't really being reflected 
uh, if it's been taken over in a way by a computer. So uh, Germans don't really exist, but at this time they did, and it was other people that are able to help. And in fact, you know, in in the history and culture of chess, I, I always felt that you know Mikhail Botvinnik could could have potentially have more help than than his opponents like Bronstein in the Germans. And for example, in the in the Bronstein you know Botvinnik match. A lot of the Germans were actually won by Mikhail Botvinnik. So in a way, it, it, there is a kind of thing about it. The more team members you've got, you know, the better you will be in the Germans. But happily uh, for Elizabeth, she did get a lot of support from her players back home who had been analysing the position overnight. They had a, a few hours to analyse it. So they, they told her what, you know, variations, what are called variations, yeah, potential different scenarios of the game. And so she was really happy. And also that was a big theme, actually, which the actor herself really enjoyed about the theme that sometimes about the film sometimes we think we're more more alone than we actually are and there is a lot of support available it's just there just right in front of us really we just sometimes we feel a bit lonelier than maybe we should be so she she was very reassured that she did have a lot of support back home so anyway queen g6 was the sealed move when they resumed the next day queen g6 so here we have knight e6 being played by Elizabeth. And in fact, in the actual game that's modelled on, we, we break apart from the real game. It was modelled on the historical game, which was Inventure Wolf, where g4 was played. The move g4 was played in the uh, Inventure Against Wolf game. And that ended in a draw in 72 moves. So this is a slightly different game now after knight e6. So Kasparov at work here, <laughs> a flight of fantasy, uh, fantasy. So rook a4, we have b3. So offering a cent the centre pawn, which was under pressure, is now being offered. So what is this about? We have knight takes d6 now being played. Yeah, so this is taking out a key defender. You'll see that a, a key defender of f8 has been taken out. So it's very, very important that black does not take on d6 here. If black takes on d6, then there's knight f8 check, which will be forking the queen and the king, so just winning that queen. So this would be absolutely crushing. So knight takes d6. We have actually bishop takes e6, taking out that potentially naughty knight, forking the queen and knight. That's taken out of the equation. But what we do have is an emerging dangerous passed pawn. Sometimes these passed pawns, they're dub what we call double-edged. Sometimes they can be a weakness and they just fall off and you've just blown your pawn. Sometimes they are pretty dangerous. So it, it hinges how, how to prove the double-edgedness of this pawn. We have e7. And now there are concrete ideas. For example, if white played rook takes f6, sometimes if the queen takes, then the pawn will queen. The queen is the one of the key defenders so-called blockading this passed pawn. We see this move d5, which means the queen is a bit freer to handle things, not having to support the rook at least. And here, this apparently wasn't in their preparation. So in Elizabeth's thing, um, they, they were worried now because they hadn't really considered this move. He wasn't supposed to play this. I remember some of Germans in the Hearts League, some of, some of our team sometimes surprised opponents playing completely, you know, inferior moves sometimes even do well when you play them in the board, on the board after the German, they might have prepared something else. So there's this shock. Okay, Elizabeth is on her own. Okay, now she on her own resources outside of the preparation for sure. If knight h5 had been played, then rook f8 shows the strength of the passed pawn already. Uh, so this is this is very dangerous, even though it's it's lucrative uh, to take on uh, g3. This just doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, so this. If knight f4, check, then taking, this This is just queening for white, and this is winning the rook. So this, this would be uh, advantageous uh, for white, even this variation. Uh, you know, this pawn is supported by that rook to queen here. So we see actually d5. So a very, very interesting move, d5. And now, bishop c5, we get what I call a killer common square. The, the rook is, in effect, x-raying f8 and so is the bishop they're both x-raying the f8 square in this position we have queen e8 a blockade queen f3 and now queen c6 and this is a key mistake actually in reality this if this is an actual chess game it would be a key mistake king g8 was needed here uh I, <laughs> because queen takes f6 as an example to crash through to f8 there would be queen f7 and black would be in the driving seat winning here the pawn would be going nowhere but with this key mistake now of queen c6 
sorry, queen c6 being played here. White now just supports the bishop, and things are very, very different in this position. Very, very different. We see now the queen going back and a draw being offered. So, not so confident. Borgov doesn't usually offer draws, apparently. Very rarely, Vasily Borgov. And Elizabeth plays check. So it's just nods ahead, <laughs> plays check. King h8. If king g8, then there would be queen e6 check. Uh, rook takes f6. This is actually devastating, this position. For example, d4, there's check picking up, well, taking the queens off and queening. And if we look at this again on queen takes, if queen h5, g4, the checks run out after king g3. And white is free to do this, for example, queen f8. And you can see the bishop's x-ray support of f8 coming into the rescue there, crushing. So in the game, queen f5, uh, king h8 was played, not king g8. And now queen takes f6. So this passed pawn now is really emphasized by this temporary queen sacrifice crashing through. The rook will support the pawn queening. What needs to be a concern, though, has black got the dreaded perpetual check? So this is a standard method, method of often drawing games. Either you can sometimes achieve a stalemate or a perpetual check, or you can... The other way is just to offer the opponent a draw, but that's been refused. So black has to hunt down a potential perpetual check, like an infinite series of checks here. We see now rook f8 check, though, and the pawn queening. So daring uh, to find, uh, to, to prove this. So king f1 was played. This is the very strongest move in the position. A disaster would be king h1. This would weaken h3. So for example, king h1 goes queen takes h3 and mating on g2. So the very strongest move was played, king f1. And the checks are about to run out. So this check, the king takes to rook. White has got a huge material advantage. And after rook f2, queen e4 check, the king just slides to d2. And that's it. We don't actually hear Elizabeth, I believe, pressing the clock. Anyway, Vasily or Bulgov says it is your game and he's holding a king and offers the king respectfully and we have a respectful hug scene and yeah it's it's just a beautifully done series i have to say uh, i really it's like one of my the favorite netflix series uh, i've seen overall you know chess or not chess and i'm definitely going to be watching it again and again and again it's just glorious the scenery the nostalgia the respect for the game of you know that that is such a big part of the heritage of certain countries like the old soviet union you know you can see elizabeth um in the final scenes you know playing playing those um street players and it's it's just really nostalgic and shows the great importance chess has been uh historically culturally Wonderful series, uh, wonderful game choice, fantastic they got Xbox involved. A lot of films are often criticised, you know, pedantically, well, I think pedantically, but on this occasion, you know, the details are there, and not only that, it's empowered with this huge, rich, dramatic respect, nostalgia, prestige, all the way through. I absolutely love it. Five out of five. Thank you, Netflix. Thank you. Please do more chess series like this. Okay. Please, everyone, watch it. Okay. Comments, questions, like, shares, subscribes. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks very much. Cheers, then.